Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Culture Word National Black Writers Conference. Um, I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Cheryl Martin, and I'm the co-artistic director of Common Word. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a middle-aged black woman um, with medium brown skin and fairly short curly hair, uh, wearing some sort of very metallic lipstick and a blue uh, a blue shirt, bright blue shirt. Um, in the background, you can see a little bit of a young Ghanaian artist um, painting and um, very multi multicolored and a teal um, sofa. And on the other side, some pink and white flowers that are in a blue and white vase. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit round faced because I'm a bit chunky actually in terms of um in terms of uh, size and just to say that this year's conference the our theme is we want to dream and that's obviously riffing on martin luther king's famous i have a dream uh i chose we want to dream because during the pandemic, talking to a lot of different black artists, people were saying that they wanted the freedom to create whatever they wanted to create without fitting into somebody else's agenda, their tick box, their stereotypes or preconceptions about what our work is supposed to be. And instead we want to do whatever we want. So um, if you want to put, you know, say hi in the chat and say where you're joining us from, we've had people today from Kolkata in India, from Buenos Aires, from other places in India, we've had a panelist from Berlin. So this is a very international conference this year. And now welcome to this particular panel, which is Queer Stories Today and Yesterday. And we wanted to get a sort of intergenerational queer um, conversation going on. And so we have Seni Sineveratne, who is a, a multi-award winning poet. We have Afshan Desizalori, who is um, a, already a much nominated uh, poet and novelist and short story writer. And Susan Kerr, who is beginning her career as a playwright. And you're going to get to hear some, a little bit of writing from everybody. And right now I will stop talking and I will go to Seni Sneveratne. Um, let me give you a little bit more background about who Seni is. Um, she is, looking at my notes, she was born and raised in Leeds, is of English and Sri Lankan heritage. She's published by People Tree Press, Wild Cinnamon and Winter Skin, 2007, The Heart of It, 2012. Unknown Soldier, which is a brilliant book and I love it to death, 2019. Her latest collection, Unknown Soldier 2019, is a Poetry Book Society recommendation, a National Poetry Day choice, and was highly commended in the Forward Poetry Prizes 2020. She is a fellow of the Complete Works Program for Diversity and Quality in British Poetry and has collaborated with filmmakers, visual artists, musicians, and digital artists. She is one of 10 commissioned writers on the Colonial Countryside Project, National, National Trust Houses Reinterpreted. She is currently co-editing co a Blood Axe anthology of post-independence Tamil, Sinhala, and English poetry and working on her fourth collection. She lives in Derbyshire and works as a freelance writer and creative artist. Um, and how fabulous is all that? So over to you, Seni. Thank you, Cheryl, for that very generous introduction. Um, uh, you asked me to describe myself. I'm, um, uh, I'm uh, as you explained, a mixed of mixed heritage. I've got brown skin and grey in hair, well, grey hair, let's face it. And uh, I'm wearing a blue and yellow striped jumper, which I knitted myself during lockdown, very proud of. And I'm working in my uh, indoor study room, um, which um, has behind me a painting on the wall that was left to me by a dear friend who died some years ago. Um, I've been trying to do whatever I want for most of my life, um, sometimes succeeding and sometimes not. Um, when I started to think about what to say today, um, I remembered a book that uh, called Talking Black, 
Lesbians of African and Asian Descent Speak Out, that was edited by Valerie Mason John. And she asked me to write a chapter for that book in 1993. The title alone might raise some eyebrows these days. In those days, black was used in a political sense to reference those of us who came together because our heritage was in parts of the world that had been colonised by the British and we were working together to challenge racism and its impact on us. Things have changed in that respect as well. Um, the book was described as the first anthology of black lesbian writers in Britain and it says on the cover, Black lesbians have been in Britain since their ancestors arrived over five centuries ago. Although sexism, racism and homophobia have tried to deny their existence, they have survived. We have survived. What's interesting about this chapter is the chapter that I did. It was about older black lesbians. And at the time, I was in my early 40s. Um, the age range, in fact, of the people that I interviewed was between 42 and 58. Um, it's strange to think now that this was the age range. In fact, I commented on it in the chapter. I said, although black lesbians have been living, aging and dying in Britain for centuries, our coming out has been hampered by our oppressions, referred to elsewhere in this book. Hopefully, in 20 years time, there will be so many visible aging black lesbians that we will laugh when we remember how we referred to women over 40 being older. And I am laughing, here I am almost 30 years later, and I'm doing just that, and maybe some of you are. But thinking about it, I realized that to have found any black lesbians of 70 and over in those days would have been very hard. They would have had to have been born in the 1920s and grown up in a time when it was hard enough to be visible as a lesbian, let alone as a black lesbian. So if I go back to when I was coming out, which was in 79, 80, um, what was I dreaming of in those days? Changing the world, um, a place where I could be myself and not a list of labels. Um, and I actually at the time wrote a poem about that, about trying to sort of be more than the labels that were given to me. Um, and, um, I've lost my place, yes. Sometimes the labels helped me to find a community. So there was a bit of a paradox there. Audrey Lord gave me the term Zami, uh, a carrier cow name for women who work together as friends and lovers. Pachiba Palmer, a filmmaker, gave me Kush from her 1991 film, exploring the experiences of lesbians and gay men in India and other parts of Asia. Kush an Urdu word, meaning ecstatic pleasure, and a term that she describes as capturing the blissful intricacies of being queer and of colour. This uplifting documentary gave us inspiring testimonies that bridge geographical differences to locate shared experiences of isolation and exoticization, but also the unremitting joys and solidarity of being Kush. Yes, finding solidarity and acceptance was important. I can remember in the early 80s being part of a, a local black women's group in Sheffield when at first I struggled with the idea of coming out to the other women in the group. And then what a relief it was when I did come out and felt accepted. It felt like a place, another place that had been created where I could feel safe with all my identities. For many black lesbians at the time, the spaces where we could explore our sexual choices were limited. For instance, I was working as a coordinator uh, in an adult education centre in a predominantly Asian area of Sheffield. And I often felt cautious about how my personal life and choices might affect the way I was seen in the community. I was also one of the founding members of um, setting up the Asian Women's Refuge. And, and I remember thinking, I don't want my sexual choices to be used as ammunition against the project. And there were positives. There were people in that community who didn't know I was a lesbian and who accepted me. They didn't let it affect how they viewed the work that I did. I remember one Asian man warning me that some of the more traditional men in the community were talking and asking questions. And now 
he had stood up for me and told them that my personal life was nothing to do with them. But nevertheless, it did make me cautious. I knew other women too, who were active in their own black communities and sometimes felt like their lesbian life had to be hidden and invisible for fear of losing support. But we did find safe places and we grew stronger with each other's support. Books were important. There was, of course, for me particularly, Sister Outsider by the American writer Audre Lorde. She defined sister outsiders as those of us who shared a commonality because we would never fit easily anywhere. This spoke to me. As a socialist feminist lesbian of mixed heritage, it spoke to my heart and often saved me from the feeling of isolation, loneliness and disillusion. And in this country, we were becoming more visible. In the pages of Outright, which was an anti-racist, anti-imperialist monthly newspaper, set up in London by a group of mainly black women, some of whom were lesbian. And also in the pages of Spare Rib. We were there in several anthologies, such as Black Women Talk Poetry, Charting the Journey, and later in a book called Making Black the Waves. We were there in black women's conferences, more welcoming some than others. And we organised our own national groups. I was involved in Mosaic, a group for lesbians and gays of mixed racial heritage. And also in an international event, the sixth International Lesbian and Gay People of Colour Conference in London, when over 300 people came together from all over the world. Those were the kinds of things that buoyed us up. I was trying to think about what my stories are from then and now. And given the limited time, I just thought it might be just best to just give a few snapshots, really. But well, first of all, it's 1984. I'm having a conversation with my daughter about homophobia to prepare her for things that might happen at school and in the outside world. She's sitting there across from me, a little girl of six years old. She's grown up in a collective household where same-sex relationships are as familiar as heterosexual ones. And I found myself having to tell her about something bad that she might face as she's growing up. People saying negative things about me and my relationships. It was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had. It's, nine, it's 2020. My granddaughter brings her new girlfriend to visit me and my partner. We have a conversation about attitudes now. And she recognises mm, it's easier for her because of our family. I mean, of course, you're going to be fine about it, Grandma, but I'm not so sure about my girlfriend's grandparents. It's 1991. I'm interviewing my daughter for an article I'm going to write about being a lesbian parent. She decides we could call it. Some people think that lesbians are strange, but my mum's a lesbian and she's not strange. Later, she writes an essay at school challenging home homophobia. And she talks to me about some of the things she deals with at school when people are being, she feels that people are being homophobic. It's 2021. My granddaughters are talking about attitudes at their schools. The youngest one has just started secondary school. There's an LGBT group in the secondary school. The older one, has just started sixth form. Um, she's at a new sixth form now. And despite all the changes for the better in society, she and her girlfriend still had verbal homophobic abuse from some guys in a passing car on their way home from school. And they're still not quite sure what their peers would be like if they came out at school. Let's go back to 1980. I knew women who were losing their children in custody cases because they were in a relationship with a woman. Sometimes the men who they'd left because of domestic violence were arguing in court that they were better parents uh, than the mothers and were winning custody. At the time, I feel very fortunate. I have a two-year-old daughter with a man who shares my politics and ethics. We've been together since university. When I come out, it's tough for us both, and we deal with the challenges, find a way of parenting her positively together. 
We live together until she's six or seven, and we're still part of an extended family that includes his two children, his partner and mine, as well as all the various grandchildren. It's 2014. I'm watching the first gay marriage on TV with my friend. He's a gay man of a similar age to me. We have a conversation about how rapidly things have changed. We can't quite believe that in the 70s and 80s, we were being vilified on the television. Gay men were being blamed for the AIDS epidemic. How in 1988, Clause 28 enshrined homophobia in law by prohibiting, quote, the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities. Introduced by Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government, it was in effect from 1988 to 2000. Rising negative sentiments towards homosexuality peaked in 87, the year before Section 28 was enacted. According to a, a social attitude survey, 75% of the population said that homosexual activity was always or mostly wrong, with just 11% believing it to be never wrong. Yeah, things have certainly changed in that respect. These days, everyone's celebrating gay marriage and Johannes and John dancing together on Strictly. And that is good to see. I know uh, gay men who I'm in the choir with feel like they often say, if these kinds of things had been on the television when we were growing up, how much different it would have been for us. And some of those times in the past were tough, but there were many joyous moments too. There was a joy of working together for change amidst adversity and the love that's generated through solidarity. There were highlight moments like that alliance that was made between miners in South Wales and um, the gay pride movement um, during the miners' strike. But those days, there was no danger of complacency. There was a recognition of fluidity and questioning of the right to make choices and break rules. Yeah, that wasn't just, isn't just a new phenomenon. That was always there. Yes, there were those in the LGB communities, and still are, who held on to rigid rules of identity and were unwilling to dialogue across difference. But thankfully, there were places where lines of communication were kept open. It's refreshing to see young people still raising questions about inclusivity. In the choir that I'm involved in, which is an LGBT choir, we've just had big discussions about extending and making our choir more inclusive and added the term plus to it. You say just, I mean, not just, but that's the sort of ongoing discussion that we've had to be more inclusive. Um, we find as young people come into the choir, we learn from them just the same way that they learn from us. And we all sing together and then we celebrate who we all are in all our range, of all our diversity. And that's where I'm going to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunny, for a really good overview of, you know, looking back and forth and how the attitudes have bounced around and changed. It's really um, sort of touching to hear this story just from inside your own family. Um, I can really see you sitting down and trying to explain to your daughter going to school and then the difference between that and your granddaughter now. Um, some things changing, some not changing. But we'll thank you very much for that. It's very touching, um, personal sort of history. And we're going to come back to that later. Um, but now we're going to go to our second writer of the afternoon, who's Susan Kerr. And I will give you a little bit of background about Susan. Susan's going to read. Um, one of her short stories. She's black and queer, and she's finally found the courage to tell her stories. She loves writing poetry, short stories, and is currently working on a play. Um, and a, a little extract from that play called Unapologetic was done a couple of weeks ago by Dibby Theater um, at home as part of the Push Festival, and it was really fun. And I'll confess, I, I directed that, so I loved it. Susan is also making a short film about the experiences of older queers and lesbians. Herself and a friend want to put on record the experiences of voices rarely heard and faces seldom seen. 
It's taken her a long time to dare to share. Racism taught her the lie that her thoughts and ideas would always be inferior. It's taken time and lots of help to challenge and melt away that particular poison and to rid her of the shame that homophobia generates. What she's left with is the joy of writing and expressing some of the complexities that she's felt and witnessed coming from her own unique perspective. And um, if that doesn't make you wanna hear more, I don't know what will. So I'll just turn over to Susan. Hi. Um, yeah, my name's Susan, uh, as Cheryl has just uh, let you know. Um, a description of myself, it's pretty straightforward. I've, I'm of mixed heritage um, and I've got a, a, a brown skin. Um, it's kind of like a medium coffee coloured kind of brown. Um, I've got dreadlocks, which I love. Um, I'm wearing glasses at the moment because I, I need them to... Um, to read um, at that age and uh, um, I'm wearing a, a black t-shirt plain black and um, yeah it's kind of white behind me and you know um, you can see a tiny bit of, of the lamp and uh, and a picture of some of my family and friends behind okay um, this is a short story um, and it kind of makes me laugh it's just it's just a a little snippet of um, lesbian life, um, and uh, yeah, so I'll I'll just read it. So it's called "Remember This." It was a rainy Saturday night, and I was feeling like I should be excited by my life, but frankly, all I could manage was my sofa and Netflix. My friend called and reminded me it was the local disco. It was an evening that drew its inspiration from a night at a youth club, but it was the longest running women only night and it could be fun. Still, I moaned and groaned and eventually allowed myself to be persuaded. The evening was as expected, a strange kind of wholesome fun that I found comforting, but tonight it also felt a little bit dull. However, quite late as things go, a woman came in and she caught my eye. She was cute in a grubby, rugged kind of way, but I loved the way she danced. She kept looking over, which pleased me, and we both smiled, increasingly dancing closer to each other. This went on for about an hour, and I decided that as death was fast approaching, I would make a move and impress her with some witty remark. So I went over and asked her where she travelled from. She looked at me and told me, Gloucester, I think. But she very quickly let me know we had been introduced at least three times before. Imagine my surprise. Really, I said, when was that? And she reeled off three events. Well, I was mortified and quite embarrassed. I apologised and we continued to make small talk and dance. Nevertheless, she kept on mentioning our previous meetings. Silently, I was wondering, what the fuck is happening? Just let it go, let it go. But I smiled and said, sorry, again. The evening was coming to a close and I, feeling incredibly modern, suggested we become Facebook friends to which she replied in a voice that dripped exasperation, we already are. She said she would unfriend me and send me a friend request again. Well, I didn't hold out a lot of hope, but to my surprise, she did. And we texted late into the night. So who knows? The end. <laughs> muted again I love that story it is so funny and I think I love it because I've done awful things like that myself <laughs> people that I've met a zillion times there and then you just sort of like gritting your teeth and thinking oh my god how could I do this um uh and I love that little um sort of 
look at the Talmud and the, the notorious Talmud in all female disco. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, wonderful story. And again, we'll come back and hopefully people will have more questions for you. Um, and the, but really enjoyed that lovely reading. And going now to Afshan, uh, this is Afshan de Souza Lodi, and I will give you a bit of an introduction to her, her. She was born in Dubai and bred in Manchester. She's a writer of scripts and poetry. Her work has been performed and translated in numerous languages across the world. Afshan's currently a lab fellow for global performance and politics at Georgetown University which is from my hometown, Washington, DC, or well, my birth hometown, Manchester is now my hometown. Afshan has been commissioned to write and direct a short film for Channel 4, An Act of Terror, and a radio play for BBC Sounds, Chop Chop. Afshan is currently a Sky Rights writer in residence for Rotherham, a partnership between Sky Studios and New Writing North. She's also currently developing a TV series with Sky Studios. Afshan has edited many anthologies and has an essay featured in Picador's collection by Muslim women called It's Not About the Burqa. Her debut poetry collection, Redesire, Burning Eye Books, has been long listed for the Jalak Prize 2021. Her most recent play, Santi and Naz, co-written with Gulerana Mir, described as tender yet sharply political by The Guardian, won the Vault Outstanding New Work Award in 2020. As well as writing, Afshan sits on the boards of Manchester Literature Festival and Pi Radio, and is also a young trustee ambassador for the Northwest. Afshan also guest lectures in creative writing for undergraduates. And boy, it says, does Afshan get around? <laughs> and so now I'll turn you over to Afshan de Suzalodi. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, you forget when you're writing these bios that someone's got to read them out at some point. Um, I'm going to edit mine uh, shortly after today. Uh, my name is Afshan. Um, I am a, a quite a light skinned South Asian woman um, with, I think, quite well done eyebrows that have been um, that are not real. Sorry for those of you that thought they were. Um, behind me is a um, blue tapestry that is quite circular. Um, and um, looks a little bit like you're on an LSD trip, which is probably the, the best way of explaining it. Um, I have a slight cough today. So um, apologies, first of all, if I go on mute, um, I will be back really shortly. Um, I'm really glad to be here as a panelist. Um, I, was, I was talking earlier with um, the other panelists before we started about how um, at one point I was running and organizing um, the Common Word conferences so it's really nice to be here not organizing and, and here as a panelist um, and to talk about something that I'm really passionate about which is about dreaming. Um, at the moment I'm working with um, uh, well consulting with um, a foundation called Langley Chase and we've been doing a lot of work in Great Manchester around this idea of dreaming so what it means to dream as an artist and and sort of um, those questions about exploring to dream is something that's really um, personal to me as, as an artist. Um, I know that as a young queer woman, I didn't really know what the boundaries were for dreaming. I didn't know that there was another way of living. I didn't know there were other opportunities because I just hadn't been given the opportunity to, to, to dream, to think about it outside of the box. Um, I remember very clearly the first time I went to contact theatre in Manchester and I came across a poem on, um, on the stairs uh, by a poet called Qasim Reza Shaheen. And it ended, and the reason the poem caught my eye was first of all, it was like an Asian name. And I was like, what, what's going on? Um, and secondly, on the tables, there were um, these flyers with Qasim wearing, um, it, it's a South Asian man with a full beard wearing a red um, sort of wedding, uh, wedding gown. Um, and for me, as a as someone who I think I'd just about come out at that point to myself and to the close friends, it was so amazing to see someone creating art from their identity and creating art that felt controversial and for me felt quite controversial and, and felt like I hadn't seen that work before. Until that point, I think I hadn't really understood that uh, South Asian people, Muslim people could be queer. 
Um, and, you know, I look back at this poem that was that was on there that's no longer there in contact there, unfortunately. And it ended with, uh, mashallah, um, an Arabic word. Um, and, and I just, as a young person, you, I was stuck in that moment. Um, and I, I ran back home and I remember trying to find um, other work by South Asian artists across the world so I could try and relate to it. And all I came across were a couple of books, um, novels, um, uh, written by people in the US and one novel written in the UK. Uh, and then I came across this short story by Isma Chukdai called Lehaf, which translates to the quilt. Um, I read it in English, um, but it's originally written in Urdu. And I guess as a short story, it allowed me to really um, look at South Asian queer representation. The author, uh, Isma Chuktai, was banned in India for quite a while for being provocative and writing crude stories. So obviously she became my idol straight away. Uh, but the story um, connected with me a lot over the years and I reread it over the years and I initially like absolutely loved it because I was like, this is, you've got queer women, you've got women that in South Asia, uh, it's, it's sort of like set in um, the 1800s. And it was just so beautifully written. I was like, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I needed in my life was to see myself represented on a page. And then I reread it again a few years later and realized that actually the portrayal of the queer women was quite derogatory. Um, and I was a bit surprised and I was like, oh, I'm not really, I don't really like how they're being portrayed by it. You know, we've moved away from this idea of any representation was good. I was like, oh, this is kind of painting all lesbians or as queer women as, um, as being quite creepy. And I didn't like that. And then I read it again a few years later and was like, actually, you know what? Isma Shukhtai was doing the best that she could have done at that point. Um, and this was a, a narrative that was being fed. So she just wrote that story. And actually what that story did for me when I first read it was that it did allow me to see myself. Just to see Angas and Riza Shahin's flyers on the table allowed me to see myself. So did reading Lahaf's Let Me See Myself. Um, and because Isma was banned, because her work uh, was you know, talked about in courts. For me, as a young writer, it had this kind of um, sexy appeal to it. Uh, so the idea of being provocative and controversial then became ingrained into my own work. Uh, I was at university uh, in London and I started a blog called Les Lesbarist, uh, which is lesbian terrorist. Uh, and it was a blog spot, it was a Google blog uh, back in the day. And it was just about me being queer and Muslim, uh, being young, being promiscuous. And it was like hilarious. There was this one blog called um, Polish Marlboro's Made Me Thin, which was about how the only way that I could afford to buy uh, a Polish Marlboro's was if I walked to uni and saved £1.80 a day. Um, and the walking um, made me thin. Um, it, it was it was funny. It was really funny. It was really nice to see uh, people in the comments come back to me actually as well. A lot of the queer people, um, because it was anonymous, um, a lot of the queer people coming back and sort of asking me questions about my life and wanting, um, wanting me to affirm their identity. Uh, I then took the blog and made a a play out of it uh, called Lesbian Terrorist or the Lesbian Tapes. Um, and I toured the, we did it as, a, as a, a three person stage play. We then did a monologue, we did a radio play. Um, and I toured the monologue version of it um, around the UK. I took it to Edinburgh one year, couldn't find an actress um, because the character is a Nakabi. So she wears the, the full burqa with only eyes showing. Um, and she begins on stage with a sex toy in her hand. Um, really difficult to find an actress to perform at uh, this piece. So I ended up doing it myself and took it on tour and surprisingly didn't get as much negative, um, as many negative responses as I thought that I would get. Um, the The character ends up taking the the gherkin uh, in the London, uh, in London, um, uh, covering it in pink lube, jamming all the elevators to make a giant vibrating dildo um, in the skyline of London. Um, that's the kind of activist, that's the kind of terrorist that she was. She was sort of taking this um, idea that she was a terrorist and flipping it on its head and sexually terrorizing London rather than, um, you know, the terrorism that we're, we understand today. 
And from that, I, I felt like my work was being finally being seen by a lot of people. Um, I didn't understand at the time that actually I was pandering to a white gaze, to a particular understanding of Muslim women, of being sexually promiscuous, of being uh, queer in a particular way, of being, of talking about terrorism even, and talking about Islam in a particular way. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it as a process. Created a short film with it for Channel 4, um, An Act of Terror, which is a three minute film that took nine minutes to get through the, nine months, sorry, to get through uh, the legal team at Channel 4. Um, because they were really concerned about it being too bold and too controversial, um, which is funny because that was a brief that I was given was to make something bold and, and controversial. Um, thankfully, in my life after that, I met a lot of other South Asian queer artists um, and majority of them were activists. They were fighting the fight. They were creating forums and networks for other queer South Asian people. And, and it felt like this was my, my calling in life. Actually, what I wanted to do was to create work for people and create a space for people to just exist. Um, so I stopped writing because I felt like nothing that I could do in my work, in my artistic work, could do the work that I wanted to do as, a, as an activist. Um, and instead I started doing interviews, I started doing think pieces. Um, I, I got asked to do a couple of essays. One was um, that I might read later on with, uh, it's not about the burqa, um, called um, Hijabi Revolution, which is about me being uh, queer and being uh, a part-time hijabi, so a, a Muslim woman who wears a hijab part-time. And something really interesting happened from that essay was I, I didn't get very many reviews from the Muslim community. Um, so in the collection, there are 17 essays by Muslim women, um, majority of them looking at what it is to exist as a Muslim woman in the UK from quite a religious, not conservative, but um, having the Quran as a background or as a backdrop to the essay. Um, but, but I kept noticing that my essay wasn't being mentioned in, in reviews online. And on the day that we launched the book in Birmingham, it was the same day the protests were happening um, in the schools um, about LGBT education. And suddenly it felt really real. Everything that I was writing about, all the articles that I was writing about, all the essays I was doing, it suddenly felt like, okay, this is a very real frontline issue because I was in Birmingham about to get a train back and was getting all these tweets about um, the protests in schools becoming semi-violent or there was this, this threat of it being violent and this fear um, within the city for queer people, particularly queer people of colour. Um, I, I think since one, one of the wonderful things that happened on that day actually, which helped calm me down a little bit was um, a young person came up to me and said that they were really glad that I wrote that essay, that they were really glad that I um, was out here being out and being queer. Um, and suddenly that became my purpose. It became like, actually, if, if only I can speak to that one queer person, if my work, my art can speak to one person and, and give them validity for their existence, then I've made it. Um, and that's how I approached my work. Um, I ended up writing again, um, writing more theater, writing poetry, um, writing fiction even that was explicit in its queerness from an activist perspective, rather than being explicit and controversial for the white gaze. Um, and it was one day that I had a conversation with the theatre, a literary manager at a theatre, a national theatre, who asked me why all of my work was political, why there was always a queer or Muslim or South Asian uh, woman uh, uh, in my work. Um, and I, I was a bit struck by the questioning um, because I don't think a white writer would have had the same questioning. Um, and, and she, you know, I was called a one-trick pony with uh, only writing queer stories, only writing stories about queer South Asian women. Um, and there was this, this simultaneous thing that happened to me as a writer. Part of me was like, oh my God, am I just, am I just writing politics? Am I just writing all of my essays in the form of theatre? Um, and the other part of me was like, well, screw you. You know, I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to write all of my work and I'm going to make it even more queerer because you don't want to have it in, because you don't want to, um, because you don't want to have it on your stage, you don't want to have it in your in your main stage theatre. Um, and it was really great for me because it, it spurred me on to write a lot more. Um, but that was, what, seven, eight years ago. Um, and it was a couple of weeks ago when I had a play on at Bolton Octagon that a queer actress came to me and told me that a queer actor, a queer character that she played in my play was the first queer character that she'd ever played. And she's been acting for years. 
Um, and I realized that in the in the seven years since I'd had that conversation with the literary manager to now, nothing has changed. Um, even in the Q&A after the play, someone asked me if I'd had backlash about creating stories about queer Muslims. And for context, this, this play is about four women in a halal butcher shop that end up killing a man and then serving him up to the customers. I don't think the queer Muslim thing is going to be the issue. And yet that's what it was. It was assumed that it would be. Um, even though I wasn't writing lesbian terrorists anymore, I may as well have done because actually everyone was seeing my work as just as controversial, just for even mentioning being queer and being Muslim. I feel like the hardest part of being an artist right now, um, I, you know, if you're an artist of color, if you're a woman, if you're a queer artist, is, is funding. Um, and the reason is that funding dictates to us what projects that we can apply for, what creative desires that we have, and to some extent, even what dreams we dream within the arts. Um, the system that we that we live in at the moment, that we exist in within the UK and even within Manchester, if we bring it down locally, is really productive driven. It's based on events, it's based on outputs. It means that all of your work ends up being tainted by this idea of what is it, what's the point of it, rather than it being about the journey and the collaboration along the way. And I wonder if I'd spent more time, and I really wished I'd spent more time really thinking about the process to create the work rather than the product of it, perhaps I'd have collaborated more. Perhaps I wouldn't have got myself into tangles where I was uh, writing articles for The Guardian or The Metro about being queer and then getting hate for it online. Perhaps I would have really thought about making work with activists rather than having to be an activist because that was a cool thing to do. I'm still figuring it out. Um, you know, thankfully I've got quite a few years on me, I think. Um, I have no idea what work I'm gonna make next or how I'm gonna make it. Um, but I just hope that the work that I make is not going to be tainted by the white gaze and is going to be like hella queer. Um, yeah, that's me. Well, thank you very, very much for that, Absam. If, um, if I could have all the panelists come back now um, on screen, if you make yourselves visible. Uh, thank you, all of you, for you know, some really thought provoking things that you've been saying. I'm actually finding it so thought provoking. I'm having trouble coming up with questions myself. I'll start with a question from the audience um, from L. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm not going to massacre your last name, L. I'd like to hear all the panelists talk about their experiences with internalized homophobia where applicable and how they broke out of that way of thinking. And just to say there is lovely stuff about all, all of what you've done that's in the chat. Um, is there anybody, I mean, you were talking a bit about that, Afshan, in yours, that um, how you broke away from, you know, sort of the internalized homophobia and stop and stop. Do you want to expand on that a little bit before we go to the others? Yeah, um, I mean, thankfully I came out quite young. Um, I was 16 uh, when I came out to myself and my friends and then semi-publicly when I was 18. So I think the idea of the, of, I was really aware of homophobia quite early on and, and racism and I was doing a lot of work quite young to, um, to counteract that. Having said that, so much of my work has been around um, and I recognize it now was around exoticizing myself to fit into this particular idea of what a queer woman or a Muslim queer woman should look like and be like to be controversial. I, you know, and I've only just started doing the work to unlearn some of that bias and some of that gaze that kind of remains on the work. Um, and there's probably a lot more that I'm still having to unpick and unlearn every day just because of the world that we live in. So I'm hoping that, I'm hoping I don't have any more internalized homophobia, but actually, I won't know until I get to that position um, or get to that experience. And for me, it's it's less about having that and more about wh what is my process for stopping myself or my friends for stopping me in that process and going, Afshan, that was a bit of a shitty thing to say. <laughs> why are you saying that? Or where has that come from? Or why are you thinking X, Y, and Z? Um, and I'm lucky that I have that network and support uh, around me. Well, thank you. and. Um... Someone in the someone in the audience is thanking you for your honesty. Um, Susan or Sunny, do you want to tackle that question? Um, I'm happy to talk about it. Really, I I think um, I think I think dealing with internalized homophobia really 
um, has set me up for dealing dealing with you know kind of the externalized stuff and how I and how I have come to a place of actually just really loving who I am <laughs> you know I think it's really I'm I wouldn't change a thing about myself do you know what I mean and um, and I think for me it's been a journey of I've got some amazing family and friends and some you know my queer family which includes you know kind of straight allies um they're just amazing people and I think somehow for me it's when I look at some look at somebody who is queer and fabulous it was then easy to say oh you know kind of what unpick all of the nonsense that you're told about yourself I think hmm I've been told a lie do you know what I mean and so I think I've just been really lucky. I'm surrounded by fabulous queer people and and they embody that, that it's a lie. Do you know what I mean? All the nonsense that you're told about what it is to be queer and that it's not okay, you look at the fabulousness of it, think, mm, someone someone be lying to me. And um and slowly but surely kind of, you know, um that that shift and that change in myself, you know, learning to love myself, but also, you know. My family, you know, I've got two beautiful sisters and stuff who, um, you know, uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> oh, sorry, it, it, it went off then. Um, I'm not great with technology. Um, I've got two beautiful sisters who I remember once, my, poor, my sister Paula, um, I said to her, you know, well, you know, um, talking about you know being being gay and just and it was that thing about you know kind of really worried that she wouldn't accept me and she's really important to me and would she reject me I remember it in this really nonchalant way saying oh whatever and moving on and it was just she didn't mean it wasn't a dismissive way it was just a kind of it wasn't an issue for her it was an issue for me and and in that moment she really showed me that you know um it was an issue for me it wasn't an issue for her and so slowly but surely being loved and accepted for for who I am with my you know kind of queer family and friends and stuff I've accepted it and and now just you know I really enjoy the joy of the you know the wonderful tapestry of of people that we you know that that the world is and stuff you know um yeah so that's how it worked for me anyway well, thank you for, thank you both for your honesty and your generosity in talking about your own experience. Did, did you want to address that, Sam? Yeah, just briefly, because I think a lot has been said that um, covered it. But when I first, when the first question first came up, I kind of felt a bit like, well, I think I'm really fortunate coming out in the 80s somehow, you know, somehow being older has been a benefit because there was so much at the kind of um, atmosphere of fighting and challenging and fighting for our right to be who we were that um, that for, for me at that time, there was this real strong sense of I'm OK, we're all OK. And we're just trying to convince all these people, you know, um, that, that, that are not kind of kind of, you know, being convinced in a way. But. So, so on that level, and, and I think, you know, like you say, Susan, I've, I've had very supportive friends, straight friends, family. And, you know, in a way, for me, it's similar to the kind of struggle that I've had around, around race and racism and about being mixed heritage. I feel like I've had um, the right kind of uh, conditions to, to feel like, I could be me and could be myself and not, and not feel put down. Having said that, I do, I am, can acknowledge that I wasn't out, out to my parents when they were alive, um, mainly because I didn't want to um, uh, cause them pain because I knew, particularly with my father, it would cause him pain and and he was very ill in the last years of his life and it, and it was like he was already ill when I'd come out and I didn't want to be another bird I didn't want that to be something else he had to deal with um, and you know my siblings are fine but I do think there's an element all along even now I mean now I mainly don't really give a shit what people think of me because um, I think that comes with age actually you just think well 
I've lived all these years. Why am I going to worry about what that person thinks about me? But um, there is still an element of self-censure and silencing. There is, There are still situations where one thinks, shall I let this person know that, that I'm, you know, in a relationship with a woman or, or shall I just keep, you know, and, and is keeping quiet about, about it, me just being, well, why should you know about my personal life? Or is it actually a fear of not just of their reaction against me, but of having to look after what they, how they respond, you know? So sometimes it's a bit the same to do with racism and challenging it. Sometimes you just feel tired with it and you think, that's really shit what you said to me, but I can't be bothered to take you up on it because I haven't got the energy. And I've had too much of it, you know. So, um, yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> well, thank all three of you for, you know, sharing, again, being so generous um, and, you know, sharing this very real sort of feeling with everyone else. Um, Okay, there's a, another There's another one from Elle. Um, I love that Susan Kerr. I can only wish I had similar support systems. Why I asked is that I've realized that there is phobia within the, oh dear, phobia within the queer community itself. For instance, cis sapphics that exclude trans experience or gold star lesbians, quote unquote, <laughs> that are biphobic because some bi women have slept with men before. I'm young, so it may be a generational thing, but our history seems to be a lot less self-divided. Mm -hmm. Are there any possible comments you can make regarding that? Um, yeah. <laughs> does anybody want to? Definitely, uh, I, I, I feel very sad about what's happening at the moment because I feel like in the past, my experience was that although there were some people who felt like they needed to be very, very separate and separatist, there was a lot of energy for alliances and a lot of energy for inclusivity. Um, so that, um, you know, what seems to have happened is that is that there's this lack of willingness to almost this fear about including anybody else in in the definition of what's queer because of what I don't understand and yeah I've come across uh, lesbians who came out when I did who are very um very resistant to some of the some of the experiences of of not just younger people there have been trans people around forever and you know there have been trans people in in the Asian subcontinent forever and it was never a, it was never a problem to us. It was just like this is part of this is part of who we're um, who we're making alliances with because we're being oppressed for the same reasons because we don't fit um, what the kind of dominant narrative is. So it makes me feel very sad that that a lot of that divisiveness seems to be generated a lot through social media at the moment. And I'm so, so glad that I didn't come out in those days when social media mm -hmm. was so, so active. I, I feel I feel worried for my grandkids, really. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the reasons I, I like the word queer and I identify more with the word queer than anything else because it feels more linked to the political um, activism side of, of inclusivity and community than uh, than for me than any of the other terms and I, and I wonder if I know there's a lot of younger people now that are using the word queer but maybe don't have the haven't contextualized it in that way um yeah it, it, yeah that's it I don't know what that means for anything but yeah I think, I think the only thing I've got to say about it is that it makes me incredibly sad um because I just think, when did we, because I think the way forward with anything is, is to, to move towards someone with, a, with an attitude of interest and wonder and say, oh, gosh, you know, like one of, you know, one of my favorite questions is, oh, tell me a little bit about yourself. And then to enter into someone's experience, you know, to enter into someone's experience and learn about, you know, how this unique individual has experienced their life and their physicality and their I mean that is fascinating regardless of who you're talking to and I think sometimes the um you know particularly the kind of you know the, the transphobia and stuff it just 
I remember I had a really sad conversation with a woman once who um, I, I was in a car giving her a lift somewhere, and um, and she was so anti-trans and and I was and I was talking to her about it, and I said to her, "Have you ever spoken to a you know a person who is trans?" And she said, "No." And I just said, that is the saddest thing I've ever heard, you know, because I just think, you know, kind of growing up, being told what it was to be, you know, kind of a lesbian. <laughs> just like, that's not my experience, do you know what I mean? It's other people yeah. put, putting their kind of who they think I am on me and that's not okay. It's, you know, being my experience of, you know, being a black woman, you're black and so you're this, this, this and this and it's, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, kind of it's 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 the way forward is I think to be really genuinely interested in someone's experience and not be threatened by it but be fascinated and interested and think oh my gosh you know mm -hmm. there are so many different ways to be human um yeah that it just makes me sad if that's not where you're coming from that you're coming from from something else that um yeah it's just it's not okay really you know um yeah, so that's what I think. I just, I think it's one of the greatest gifts. I love being genuinely interested. I think it's a, a great yeah. gift. It's a great gift to give to my daughter and, you know, to, to the wonder of the world, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's what I think. I, I love that idea of the wonder of the world and the joy of discovering other people, that there are a, a zillion different ways to be human. And it's endlessly fascinating. But before I go on to um, some more questions, um, I, since Sunny and Afshan are both writers, I thought I'd give them a chance to read something. Um, Sunny, did you want to read something? Oh, um, okay. Um, yeah, um, I need something appropriate. But um, it, one of the ways that writing has helped me is 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 dealing with experiences and difficult experiences. So um, my book before this last one was called The Heart of It, which was um, really half of the book was um, me processing the end of a long-term relationship. And I um, um, thought, well, maybe I'll read a poem from there because it's a while since I have. And um, although I don't feel like this now, it was a real experience at the time and uh, yeah. So um, I'll read this one. This would have been a love poem. It was a place whose name I forget. The moon wasn't up. The post, a distance over fields. Ruined castle on an outcrop. The sky like a dance and everything fading. We were drinking German beer forget the name. We said we'd come back and eat. We generate a word in an outhouse. He was writing the sky in a notebook. On the way up the lane, my hands had brushed the fuchsia hedge so the flowers fell. I remember her voice in the evening air, the way we decided to have another beer. That's beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and Afshan, do you want to read something as well? Yeah, um, I mentioned um, it's not about the burqa um, and my essay in there, and I thought I'd read a small extract from there. Um, so the the essay starts with me talking about how I'm a, a part-time hijabi, so I wear a headscarf part-time, um, and what it is to be a queer Muslim. Reclaiming Islam as a queer woman has been hard. Islamist terrorist attacks across the globe mean people shrink when they see brown skin. Attacks in queer spaces and against women mean people wonder what reasons I have to wear a hijab now. Why after all these years of Islamophobic attacks, assaults and racism, would I own a religion and culture that seemingly hates who I am? Making my faith mine has been a journey and a half and I'm still not there yet. All I know is that if I don't own it, then I'm broadcasting a message of fear and I lived in fear most of my life. Fear when I see a group of white boys throwing fireworks into the middle of the street and wondering if the next one will be aimed at my face. Fear of coming home to my mum after a brilliant performance at queer festival and wondering if she'll shout at me. Fear of going to hell after waking up from a failed suicide attempt. 
fear of not being good enough. I'm done being scared. If I don't take ownership of my body, my religion, my headscarf, and my sexuality, then I'm telling the bigots that they've won. I'm done giving power to racists and white feminists who want to dictate how Muslim women should dress. I'm done engaging in conversation with people who don't understand that human beings are complex, that I can wear, I can wear a hijab and a dress, that I can be queer and Muslim, that I can exist. Tomorrow, the next day, and the next when I get up, dressed, I will look at myself in the mirror and decide there and then if today will be a hijab day. It looks like the scarves are better come with me. Oh, thank you very much. You know, again, wonderful, wonderful words. Um, and, you know, I just thought, you know, it's impossible to have writers on and not get them to talk a little bit about just the writing, because that's also part of, you know, we want to dream dreaming is being you know accepted as a writer and not as an issue um there's a, a question um from the audience personal recommendations for queer content like books movies plays things like that does anyone want to start? i could tell people about the book i was uh, so for some historical perspective this book talking black lesbians of African and Asian descent. I don't know whether it's still available, uh, but um, I can put some details in, in the chat about it because there are chapters in here on, on um, young women, older women, uh, the media, literary movement. Uh, yeah, a whole load of things. So just as a, for a historical perspective on black lesbians, that would be a good read. And of course, I'd always recommend Audrey Lord, Sister Outsider. <laughs> if you really make it help you feel good about yourself. <laughs> um, thank you. Is, isn't it Audrey Lord? Does she have an E on the end of her name? Yeah. yeah. A U D R E, yeah. Yeah. I'm just dropping that into the chat. And if you have more information about um talking black, yeah, that would be great. Um, I've Afshan has put a link in. Afshan, yeah. do you want to say more about that? Yeah, Maz Hedgehog, who's um, a poet and performer based in Manchester, has got a collection coming out called The Body and Its Seasons. Um, and I think it really looks at experimental poetry um, from a queer Black perspective. Um, and what I like about it is the experimental side of it, which you don't often see within um, poetry or performance poetry. So. Um, it's not out yet, it's out soon, but I have had a read of it already and it is amazing. So pre-order it um, straight away. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And that that link is in that link is in the chat. Can you put that to everyone? Because right now it's just the hosts and panelists. So that link will be coming. Susan, do you have some recommendations? You just disappeared. So maybe that means that you don't have any recommendations or did you just disappear? I, sorry, I just went to look on my bookshelf because I know I've got another recommendation, but I can't find it. It's a book that I got from South Africa about uh, queer Muslims. And, uh, um, but I can't actually put my hand on it right now. But there's a lot of really good stuff coming that I came into contact with in, um, in South Africa. And there's a fantastic film that was made by a guy who was an imam. I met, I met a gay imam when I was over there who was just amazing. And there's a, um, a guy who's made a film um, where he interviewed queer Muslims um, around the world. So, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd take a bit of time to, to look that up so I can pass it, I'll definitely pass it yeah. on to Rash and, and um, to you, Cheryl, in case well, you can. Sure. I'll out. drop the line. I'll drop your line, Sandy, because I'm actually going to South Africa in a couple of weeks. So maybe we well, can. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I can give you some tips about <laughs> who to see and where to go. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if you have any, you know, anything like books or things that you think of that you can't think of right now, if you email us that, we'll put it on our website later. There's yeah. another question for Abshan. Can you talk more about reconciling your religious beliefs? with your sexuality? How do you understand the institution as well as personal faith? Yeah. Um, 
So for a long time, when this question came up, I refused to answer it um, because uh, there was this understanding that as a as a person of color, as a Muslim woman, I had to always justify my existence to other people. But I've not answered this question in a long time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Um, for me, it's it's um, the scripture that I read and I look at the Bible and the Quran and the Torah in the same lens. Um, their guidelines and their stories and their perspectives of people's lives and people's existences. Um, and that's how I read them. My existence, um, I feel, has been, um, it, I've been made by God, right? In every single, uh, down to like me dyeing my hair and why I do that. It's also um, from God. So for God to create something that then is um, calling evil or calling wrong or calling a sin, um, is not what God would ever do because then I cannot be put on a stadium and be judged for being a bad person or a good person. Um, and that for me is, is what it comes down to is that I believe in a just God and I believe in a, in a kind and generous God. And for me, a kind and generous God wouldn't create something and then say that that thing by definition, by creation is, is sinful or bad or evil. Um, I live my life. I like to think I live my life with love and compassion. And that's what I believe the, the faith that I fall into um, promotes. Um, and being queer just means I love more people in it. There's like, um, so yeah, that's that's how I reconcile it. A lot of other people need to find scripture and do it that way. Um, and that's fine for them. Um, for me, that's not how I read it. I mean, I'm re I've been reading the Bible more recently and reading it as perspectives um, rather than it being a, a literal uh, word, because even though it's come, even if it was word, literal word, it's come by humans and it has been changed over the years so for me it's about what is the message behind it and the message is about love and compassion well again thank you for being so generous with your answers um everyone um susan we didn't i mean uh, that's you know it's actually everything you're saying is so thought-provoking is i feel stupid going on to something else after that but um i'm just gonna try and give everybody their go um Susan, did you have any books or films or things um, for queer content you want to? Uh -huh. I did, I did. I'm sorry, my I I I completely left, and so I'm back now. Um, I just wanted to kind of say um, a bit of heads up to um, there's this new um, thing called Les Flicks, which is a take on Netflix, and it's um, it's you know kind of lesbian um, lesbian content and stuff. And there's a, it's going to be really unhelpful, but there was a, there's a really good series on it and stuff that I watched, I watched with Cheryl actually, maybe Cheryl can remember, but it's set in like San Francisco or something and it's a group of lesbians and it's just very, it's just very lighthearted and funny and, um, and I just really loved it for, for, um, you know, our community, it just really reflected, you know, kind of, um, yeah, just really, you know, there's lots of, of women of colour and stuff. There's lots of women of different sizes, you know, um, and it and and some of the things they say are so funny because it's so, you know, kind of you've heard the conversations before and they're so kind of authentic and um, and so you know for a kind of an afternoon and stuff to watch with your mates, it's just a really, you know, it was just a really good. Um, it was a really good series, you know, and and I like that. I like the kind of ordinary funniness of, you know, our community and stuff. Um, you know, it was I loved seeing it on the on the um on you know, I watched it on my computer and stuff, but it felt really nice that it's part of part of the becoming part of the bigger picture, really. And it's fun actually, it, it was good fun. So I wanted to recommend that. Um, there's again, thank you for that. I can't think of the name of it either, but it was quite funny. Mm -hmm. Um, just and then just to remind you, too, if you go back to the Culture Word Conference page, you can find you know books by all the speakers mm -hmm. you have today. Um, Susan will have a play out very soon called Unapologetic. Let's hope when we get the funding. Uh, and I hear what people say about funding, you know. It, it, the whole thing about who's allowed to be an author and who's allowed to be an artist. Um, part of what we're trying to do is platform people 
And what Common Word has always done is get people started. So 30 years ago, when I was a student, they got me started and I'm still here. So, and uh, Shana's work there, Sunny's work, you know, with Common Word. Susan, I heard that story first in a Common Word. Um, notes on a mic drop, the queer writers workshop, black work writers workshop we've got. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody today. Um, lovely hearing, lovely hearing what you're saying, a bit of your writing, and to connect those generations. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, in queer communities, our, our generations are not talking to each other. But I, I think that we've found places now where that can happen. And hopefully this conversation can keep on. Um, uh, in, in the chat, if people look, you can read and watch pieces from the panelists. There's a link there. Um, and, you know, go back and find lists of their books and just drown yourself in them. They're great. Um, on, the, on the screen right now, we've got um, common word feedback for um, this event. This, again, is about um, thank you, Arts Council, for funding us. And this is about so that we can report back to the Arts Council and hopefully get even more money. Um, so if you could fill that poll out, it's really quick and it'll really help us. And I don't know what else to say to the panelists. Um, thank you, Sunny uh, Tenevaratne, Afshan de Lodi, Susan Kerr. Um, and I hope that we get to work with you much more in the future. Um, Sunny came and did like a reading over Zoom for us from Own Nun Soldier um, during the pandemic. I'm telling you that was the highlight for me of that, that particular set of workshops. It was so good. Um, and right now, um, as part of We Want to Dream, we had a little bit of a, um, a film. Are there two more films now? Uh, make sure that we had a competition called We Want to Dream. And we asked people to do a two minute film and either the first words or the last words had to be, we want to dream. And so now we're going to show you a couple of those films. And if you want to see even more films, there um, at six o'clock, we've got a brand new commission by some up and coming black queer people. It's a pretty much queer film time. Um, and then you can see all you can see um, a lot more of the We Want to Dream competition films if you would like to. Um, so come back at six o'clock uh, for Dreaming on Screen. Um, and then don't forget tomorrow there's many more works. There's a workshop from Chanje Kunda. There's um, there's another generative short story workshop from a panelist earlier today in Divya Galani from Berlin. Um, and we have an experiment in how to support writers, unlock the story, come and see what that is. Um, so I'm just gonna let you go now because I can just keep talking forever. Um, in the chat, you can see where you can keep the conversation going. And now for the films. And thank you again, lovely panelists. Thank you. We want to dream out nostalgia, but the past forces itself on the future, like spike synapses. Girls snatched by men and crammed into Ubers, we black out into wine and white powder, find new vices to quit and new lovers to mourn over. We chase pleasure to pause disaster in the ceasefire that is wonder. The worst thing that can happen is that nothing happens or everything happens at once. We fade into our metal slabs to forget the morgue and its metal slabs. We sink into the matrix that is Instagram whilst thirsting for eternity and extinction. We feel obliged to walk miles for the steel machine. Every breath is a blink, void in a glaring black hole. Every success is a prayer swallowing exile. We bite our nails while thinking about the bills and emails and smile about the big picture and cry about the details. Nothing makes sense when we think about it, so we all try to have the good sense not to think about it. Find ways to make thoughts stand still or else time will remind us of its restless hands. We ache to experience more than waking life can stand. Some days we see God in the taxi man, or dream God in the girl who scans our copper bird cans. Sometimes we see God in the way the clouds dance. So certain God grew inside Harriet Tubman and Anne Frank. We know God is the spitting image of Basquiat, 
dazzlingly brilliant and black. We know God is an old friend who comes every now and then to sit in our garden and paint the sunset. Sometimes we laugh because we know the God in us hasn't died yet. We no longer fall for walking cliffs, the eye edge of eclipse. Familiar darkness that distracts us from our own abyss. The nightmare of news. The limits of love, opinion and politics. But we're awake now. On writing us. If we tell you no, will you go ahead anyway and walk on the breath from our mouths as it sighs and stutters? If we tell you yes, will you reshape the pieces of our soul that spreads itself across the blank page, smudging the edges, blurring? If we tell you she can fly with wings as broad as the back of a mother, will you clip them cleanly? When we show you the ways in which she is whole and flawed and fantastically made, will you type in stereo? When we pour out the words that for years were held back through your disbelief, and we enunciate each syllable, will you finally believe that we are complete and we want to dream? <laughs>